I just would love to know how many were here for the big day out last weekend, just for me to get a sense. Okay, so one great thing, if you weren't here last weekend, is that I'm going to give you a few little highlights, and we're going to take all that amazing uh, encounter that was experienced here and I, I believe we're going to receive it even if we weren't here and take it a little bit forward. Um, we spoke about the unseen foundations last week. The love of the Father. Levi spoke on the love of the Father. Eileen spoke on the power of the Spirit and Alec on Sunday spoke on the obedience of Jesus, all of which are present in Jesus' baptism, right? And those are the unseen foundations. And today we're, we're starting a series on open to the Spirit, and I'm going to focus on being open to the Spirit through forgiveness. Because one of the things that, two, well, there were two particular testimonies, a uh, number of testimonies, but two in particular really struck me. And Kat, you may want to even just come up here and repeat the one. Do you, do you feel it coming up, or do you want me to try to paraphrase it? I felt um, a word about um, Elijah and how um, after he, it's that passage in 1 Samuel 18, where after he defeated the prophets of Baal, he um, is crying out to God to end the drought that there had been for a number of years. And um, he's got his head on the floor, he's praying, and he sends his servant to look seven times to see. And seven times there's nothing. And then on the seventh time, there's a cloud the size of a small fist. And, um, and then there's a massive kind of downpour. And in the Bible, that rain, rain is a sign of God's blessing. It's not always in the UK. Uh, but <laughs> in, in Israel, it's a sign of blessing. And um, I... I, uh, I just profoundly felt that sense of us being on the precipice of God moving and seeing that cloud in faith, um, that, that cloud, that small fist of blessing on the horizon. Mm. And part of that, you linked sort of long, unanswered prayer and also this kind of downpour of power, prayer and power. The other uh, picture that Eileen is not here, but Eileen in her talk about the power of the Holy Spirit, talked about having the courage to open those boxes that have possibly been sealed in our heads, mindsets, regrets, narratives that are holding us captive, that we might not even re realize are holding us back from our fullness, from the full. And, and you know, some stuff might come out. You know, what, you know this, that stuff might come out. I found it very um, powerful to realize some stuff that I'd been kind of just operating under. And it's been amazing this week. And guess what? Some creepy crawlies have come out. So as we think, what does this have to do with forgiveness? First of all, how do we prepare for the downpour? How do we get ready for the blessing so that our ground isn't so dry and hard that we either have runoff on the one hand or a flood, which is yet a different problem, right? How do we soften our ground? And secondly, when we open those boxes or even think about opening those boxes, because I wouldn't advise doing it until you feel safe doing so, because let me just say some stuff's going to come out. And there may be some things that need some work. There may be some, dare I say, forgiving to do, which is one of the things, you know, we talk about grace. Grace is freely given and freely received. We do have to open our hands, though, to receive it, don't we? There is something we can do. A, we show up like you have. And B, not that it's just here, as Jenny said. God's speaking to us all the time. But, like, we have to show up. We have to listen. We have to prepare ourselves. And I believe that forgiveness is one way when we're ready to do that. Amen? Thank you. Okay. So if you weren't here last week and you're like, I have no idea what she's talking about, I want to suggest that in the wake or in the preparation for the upcoming election, and dare I say elections, this is the year of the election, in the advance of the England game tonight, in advance of, or not in advance, during the Pride weekend, all this stuff in the atmosphere might be triggering some things that need forgiveness, no? Remember the last Euros? 
horrendous. Remember, you know, all the stuff that's happened, as Kat was saying, in politics recently, and it's happening all over the world. And, you know, boy, the church has not really been that great to the LGBTQ plus community. We have a lot of forgiving, a lot of for, for, forgiving to, to be, we got a lot of apologies to be making, and we could use some forgiveness. So I would argue that whether we were here or not, there's that, and then there's just life, right? I mean, whether it be somebody cutting you off in traffic or on your bike or whether it be something in your family life, like keeping our hearts clean is hard, right? And when we don't do this, we create almost like a film on the windshield allowing us to see what God is doing. And we need to sort of get that muck off the windshield, right? And we can do that. I believe forgiveness is a bit like that squeegee thing when you're in your, you know, when you do that in your car and the stuff comes out and, you, and it, it makes it come off easier. So what I want to turn to is John 20, verses 19 to 23, which is set on the evening of Jesus' resurrection. So let's turn to this passage if you want to um, on your Bibles, or just read it on the screen. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus stay, came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send, am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So this week, we'll go to the polls, if you haven't voted by post already. And as I said, this is the year of the election. Did you know 49% of the world's population is going to vote this year across 64 plus countries? And that doesn't even include the EU. Kind of incredible. And, you know, during elections, especially ours, there's usually a lot of talk about taxes. Taxes. Yes, we know we have to pay them. And I feel like forgiveness is sometimes viewed a little bit like pat taxes. As followers of Jesus, we know we have to do it. We say it in the Lord's Prayer all the time. But I have yet to meet somebody who says to me, I can't wait to pay my taxes. And nor have I ever met anybody who said, I can't wait to forgive that person. Right? It's uncomfortable. It's hard. It's inconvenient. We don't even like to admit sometimes we have to do it. And by the way, we all know people, I suspect, hopefully not ourselves, but, you know, maybe. We know people who cut corners on their taxes, don't we? Who pay cash when offered the chance to avoid VAT or have that person off their books or have some kind of fishy contract that doesn't, you know, allows them to save. And we say to ourselves, well, it's not like I'm Amazon, who made like, you know, 44 billion euros out of Luxembourg and paid zero tax in 2020, right? It's not like I'm like that person. This isn't really cheating. And I'm not trying to give Amazon a hard time or, or tax lawyers, if you're one of those. Um, you know, they're following the rules. I just wonder if there might be some loopholes that need closing. And similarly, I wonder whether there's some loopholes in our hearts around forgiveness where we kind of say, well, but I surely don't have to forgive that person. Or it's not that big a deal, that grudge, or, you know, I, I, I'm fine. I'm fine. And no one's really getting hurt. I think one telltale sign around perhaps a need to forgive is what makes us angry what triggers us. And there is righteous anger, 100%. Jesus turned the tables, right? He absolutely upended things. He was angry. And for good reason. But where we start to have the feelies kind of spill out, spill over into conversation or into, 
you know, a bit of road rage or cycle rage or, you know, what are those feelings telling us? You know, it's a great quote, feelings are great messengers but horrible masters, right? We're told, be angry but do not sin and really try not to let the sun go down on your anger. I know that's not easy and doesn't always possible, but we see Jesus breathing on the disciples saying, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. That's an incredible piece of authority that Jesus is giving his disciples. That's us. That's us. And throughout every other passage, we know that unforgiveness puts us in some kind of prison, right? So what's Jesus doing here? What is Jesus doing? Well, a number of commentators think that Jesus is specifically commissioning the disciples, that's us, to continue his mission in the world. And the way they're meant to do that is by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the only way. And this isn't just to proclaim the good news, but also to forgive or retain sins, presumably through the sacrament of baptism. This links with Matthew 28, Great Commission, where Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this breath, right? This breath where Jesus breathes on them. It brings life. And if you're reminded of the breath that went into Adam, the Hebrew word for well, humanity, if you're reminded of the breath that went into the bones in Ezekiel 37, which also came up last week. If you're reminded of the verse that Isla quoted in Romans, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies. Also, through his spirit that dwells in you. If those verses came up as you heard that passage in John 20, Jesus breathed on them, you would also be joined by many biblical commentators. But even more important, I think it's the Holy Spirit speaking through Scripture. We need this breath, don't we? We need this breath. Should we just take a breath? We need that breath. That breath of the Holy Spirit that helps us to forgive and in turn be forgiven. And it also helps us thread the needle between avoiding or denying the need to forgive or weaponizing forgiveness on the other. Because that is not what we're called to do. So I want to spend a moment before we talk about what forgiveness is. We've sort of hopefully established it's pretty important. And there's a ton of other verses, notwithstanding like the Lord's Prayer, that say how important it is. But Jesus is clearly giving us a bit of a choice, right? Particularly as his disciples. And I want to just talk about how forgiveness, I think, has been misunderstood. In fact, it's gone so far as weaponized. And the weaponization of forgiveness is where we're pressured to forgive too quickly. I would call it, in a way, it's cheap grace, isn't it? It's where we shift responsibility from the harmer to the harmed. Well, you know you have to forgive that person. And let me be clear, any abuse needs to first focus on the well-being and health of the harmed. And the restoration of their freedom. And if that's you... I hope that we, this place, can be part of that. And this weekend, as I mentioned, we celebrate pride. And as a church seeking to create belonging for the LGBTQ plus community, I recognize that there may be hurt that's been perpetrated from the church and perhaps, God forbid, even this church. And it may be the case whether you identify as LGBTQ plus or not, Fake forgiveness should never be weaponized as a replacement for justice. And we need to clean up our messes, which is why we have adopted a spiritual abuse policy, which is why we want to be part of that process and hear if there is pain that we've been part of. And we apologize on behalf of the church for that that's been perpetrated. Amen? And this acknowledgement is a really important part of forgiveness. You know, Jesus preached about 
being spirit-led, and that was part of our leadership series around what it means to be a Jesus-led, spirit-led group of followers that lead. So first of all, let's not weaponize it, and let's recognize that it's also not the same as a legal pardon. There are processes of justice that are need to be done in parallel, and we need to clean up our mess. Okay, secondly, forgiveness is not the same as reconciliation, and it's by no means the name same as trust. I remember being pressured in my early theological study by a fellow classmate to reconcile with someone with whom I'd set some pretty strict boundaries, but was seeking to work through a process of reconciliation with a third party. And that person did not want to do that. But I had let go of a peace at any price kind of relationship. And I also knew I needed to work toward forgiving that person. But I couldn't control what their process was. Now, hallelujah, we did reconcile 10 years later and were restored to relationship with some healthy boundaries. It still needed active boundary setting, and I'm not saying that's always the case. But this person who told me that I wasn't being a good follower of Jesus because I wouldn't let this person back into my life, that that for them was my forgiving them, was very unhelpful. And I was very blessed to have a pastor in my parish church where we went, who I called and would, saw me and said, no, 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 let's look at how Jesus set boundaries. Let's look at Matthew 18, which we won't talk about. But if you're struggling with that, I would love to encourage you to look at Jesus's words on his uh, conflict management, particularly for those in the church. He recognizes that we're going to need it. And even the disciples, as you see in this, chant, in this passage, are given the option to hold bound. But we also know that that holds us bound as well. And for me, forgiving this person did take years. And sometimes, a bit like Harry Potter's scar when he's in the presence of Voldemort, you know, I, I start to sting again. You know, there's seasons in our lives that sometimes, like, the rain washes up a bunch of muck in the soil that we thought we'd weeded out. And it's like, wait a minute, I thought we took out all those stones and that broken glass. But something sometimes washes it up again, which is why it's a constant process. But being pressured to forgive before you're ready or before you've even felt the pain is merely a plaster over the wound. And it may be that the most we can do is pray for that person and pray for ourselves and our inability, inability to forgive right now. Like the man who said, help me in my unbelief when he was asking for healing of his son. We can say, help me in my unforgiveness, Lord. So there's hope. And, you know, maybe this is why when Peter asks after that great conflict management lesson, which uh, is sort of subject of another sermon, but, but Peter says, you know, Lord, if any other member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? And Jesus says, not seven, but I tell you 70 times seven. And maybe we have to just keep saying the words or keep showing up to pray for that person amidst our pain and our anger and our possible grudge, until it starts to ease. Because I believe it will ease, even if it takes, you know, the other side, to have, the other side to, to, to do it. I would like to suggest, though, that, un, not, that, that forgiveness is less like taxes than a gift from duty-free. Yeah, we've all been, hopefully, airport, train station where there's those duty-free options. And we've had the situation where, like, oh, my gosh, I'm staying at the house. I haven't gotten them a gift. I'll bring them some English tea or some biscuits. Or, or you're caught on your way back and you're thinking, I didn't bring my, you know, friend or my husband or my wife or my partner uh, something. I should just pick that thing up. And we sort of think, oh, this is nice. I don't have to pay taxes on it. You know, so I would like to encourage us to embrace forgiveness as less like taxes and more like a duty-free gift that we might receive or extend with joy or at least contentment. 
And I'm reminded of the story of Jacob and Esau. You remember the brothers who, oh gosh, did they have a lot of stuff going on, didn't they? I mean, Jacob steals Esau's blessing from his father with his mother's help. They've been estranged for many years. And now Jacob needs Esau's blessing. We're in Genesis 32, if you ever, if you want to look it up. But basically, J Jacob has fled his father-in-law with his whole entourage, many wives and sheep and all these kind of things. And uh, he needs Esau's blessing because he's going to go through his territory. And he's afraid. And he prays to God desperately for a peaceful reconciliation with Esau. In Genesis 32, 11, he says, Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I'm afraid he will come and attack me and also the mothers with their children. So the next day, Jacob prepares his family. He has a substantial peace offering ready, the duty-free gift, I guess, and uh, for his meeting with Esau. And to his surprise, Esau warmly embraces him. He's thrilled to meet his family. He tries to refuse the gifts until Jacob insists and says, No, please, I have found favor in your eyes. Accept this gift from me, for to see your face is like seeing the face of God. To see your face is like seeing the face of God. That's what forgiveness can do. Jacob knew he'd messed up. He knew he kind of deserved Esau's wrath. But actually, not only does Esau accept Jacob's apology, but Jacob receives the grace of Esau and he is freed. That's what we do when we can truly forgive our brother, sister, friend from our hearts. In psychology today, uh, Professor Robert Enright, who's a professor of educational psychology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, a place I actually spent a summer working for the police department, another story. But he basically writes on the power of forgiveness from a psychological perspective. So even in the secular, this is where secular and sacred meet. He acknowledges the poor practice of weaponizing forgiveness, but adds that the risk of avoiding it entirely keeps things buried. He says, when there's physical injury, sometimes surgery is needed. And yes, the surgery is an added burden, but it is temporary and restores what is broken. It's the same with forgiveness. When the heart is broken, sometimes we need surgery of the heart to restore emotional health. Isn't it powerful in this story that Jesus appears to him, them with his wounds? I wonder if on the other side, we too will have our wounds, our scars, all the stuff we think we want to hide, we want to bury. That's part of our wholeness. It was part of Jesus' wholeness. One of my favorite stories growing up was Velveteen Rabbit. Anybody know it? Yes? Well, for those who don't know it, it's about a um, loved stuffed rabbit and his heartfelt desire to become real. Today, he might say, to be based. But one day, he's talking to one of the other stuffed animals, the skin horse. The skin horse has been around a long time wise skin horse, and the velveteen rabbit asks the skin horse, how do you become real? And the skin horse says, it's a thing that happens to you. When a child loves you for a long, long time, not just to play with, but really loves you, then you become real. Does it hurt, asked the rabbit? Sometimes, said the skin horse, for he was always truthful. When you are real, you don't mind being hurt. Does it happen all at once, like being wound up, he asked, or bit by bit? It doesn't happen all at once, said the skin horse. You become. It takes a long time. That's why it doesn't happen often to people who break easily or have sharp edges or have to be carefully kept. Generally, by the time you're real, most of your hair has been loved off and your eyes drop out and you get loose in the joints and very shabby. 
But those things don't matter at all. Because once you're real, and you can't be ugly, except to people who don't understand. You know, in a world where it can be hard to know what is real, much less what it is to be real, Jesus invites us to the real, doesn't he? And I believe when we bask in his beloved eyes, in those eyes of love, and we know how precious we are, how loved we are, I think we can become real, wounds and all. And we can let go of the clench fix and open our hands for more of the power and love and healing and joy and gifts of the Holy Spirit. He invites us to be held in his beloved gaze, to have that skin time with the Father when all our hair has been rubbed off. And for all our sharp edges and fragility and to be smoothed and viewed in the eyes of love. And it's when we are held and beheld in the eyes of love that we can hold out that same gift for others. Because we can only give what we've received, right? So I'd love to invite our worship team back up. And you know, it's tempting being somebody that one of my strengths and weaknesses is a temptation to try to fix things. It's tempting to try to do a forgiveness prayer right now, but I'm not going to do that. I want to invite Holy Spirit to speak to us. And as we worship in this final song to just ask, even have the courage to ask, Lord, is there any... Are there any sharp edges in me? Is there any dry ground that needs softening through your amazing duty-free gift of forgiveness? And then for those who are able, I know we're a little bit late, I'd love to invite us up for some time of ministry. But let's worship and ask.